Hey everybody, welcome to lesson number one in this new Bible study series on prayer. This is going to be a topical study, so we'll be looking at various passages all over Scripture uh, over the course of these 13 weeks, but it's all going to be uh, aimed at and centered around the topic of prayer, what that means for us as Christ followers. Uh, you are going to need your uh, listening guide for this lesson. You'll find it the same place you found this video. Just scroll down and click on that link. It's a PDF that you can download to your computer and print out. There are some blanks to fill in during the teaching portion of the lesson. Uh, you'll also want your Bible or your Bible app opened today to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6 today. Before we jump into the lesson, though, let's pray together, shall we? It feels a little bit funny to us, Father, praying about prayer, uh, but it's hard to imagine a more important topic for us as Christ followers than how we communicate with you, how we stay in community with you through the work of the Spirit in our hearts and through the work of your Word. Uh, it's just hard to imagine a more important thing, Father. And so our prayer, as always, is that as we open your word today, you will open our hearts and that you'll teach us to pray. You'll teach us what prayer is all about. Uh, that's our prayer for this entire series, Lord, that you'll change us, uh, that our prayer lives will change, that we ourselves will be changed as a result of this study. Change how we see ourselves, how we see the world around us, change how we understand who you are, we want to be different, Father, because we want to become the people that you've called us to become. We know that that's a, a gradual transformation process in each of our lives, and so our prayer is that you'll continue that process even today. We love you, Lord. We love your word, and we love its place in our lives, and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Prayer as a central discipline to following Jesus. That's how we're going to be approaching uh, the topic of prayer. Uh, it's, uh, for, the, for the Christian, it feels to me like uh, it is, is, as, is as close to living radically as we can get. In fact, uh, one of my favorite writers, Sky Jathani, says that living radically is about prayer, not prominence. Uh, what that means for us as Christ followers, it's not so much how well known we are, it's not so much how many followers we have on Twitter, uh, it's really much more about um, uh, our communication and being in the presence of God. Uh, prominence for a, I mean, a, a, a radical lifestyle for a Christian is really all about that. It is about how close am I to God? How, how much am I living in intimacy with God? That's what we're talking about when we talk about prayer. Uh, so each week as we look at a different passage about prayer, we'll be asking the same couple of questions about these passages. Number one, what does this passage say to me? What does it teach me about prayer? Uh, in other words, how is it going to change my understanding of prayer? But, but number two, how does this passage then cause me to pray? Uh, if, if, if this study is not pressing me, into time with the Lord and actually causing me to pray, then I won't have done this right. I want to be pressed into time with the Lord and I want these lessons for me to change how I understand that time and to cause me to do it even more. Today we're going to be talking about a specific topic around prayer, which is the topic of spiritual warfare. Uh, we find this in Ephesians chapter 6. It's actually a metaphor that the Apostle Paul uses to talk about uh, our calling as Christians. I think that we tend to confuse spiritual warfare, to conflate it, uh, which is a spiritual concept, with cultural warfare. Uh, and we need to make sure we see them as two separate things. Cultural warfare, warfare is much more a, a political concept, an ideological concept. Uh, while there may be some overlap between spiritual warfare and cultural warfare, they are definitely not the same thing, and keeping those separate in our minds is important, especially as we try to understand the role of prayer in spiritual warfare. Uh, there is only one posture for spiritual warfare for a Christ follower, and that posture is on our knees. Uh, 
on our knees before the Lord. That's where we do spiritual warfare. That's where it happens. Paul's letter to the Ephesians um, is, uh, is an amazing letter about our life together as Christians. It has so much to say to us about walking in the Spirit and, and doing life together in community with other believers. Uh, it, it's, it places a great deal of emphasis on that idea of living, quote, in the Spirit, and what does that mean? And we're going to see that come up in today's lesson as well. In chapter 6, uh, after talking a great deal about a, a wide variety of topics uh, with the church in Ephesus, in chapter 6, as he gets down, as we get out into verse 10 and following, he begins to use this metaphor of warfare. Now, uh, I grew up and still live in San Antonio, Texas. San Antonio, Texas is like military city USA. There was, when I was growing up here, we had five active military bases in San Antonio. And so uh, you would think that someone growing up in San Antonio would know something about warfare because of all of the military presence here. But I'm going to tell you that I've, I've never served in the military and I won't pretend to be any kind of an expert in actual warfare. What I do want to understand is what is Paul talking about when he begins to use this metaphor about putting on the armor of God and fighting a spiritual fight? What does that mean? That's what we're going to be looking at. And what he does in verse 10 uh, in chapter 6 is he turns his attention to this battle between good and evil that is constantly and always going on all around us in the unseen spiritual world. It's what he refers to as the heavenly realms. The heavenly realms is his code language, if you will. It's, it's his term that he uses for that unseen spiritual world that is around us. And he's using spiritual warfare then as a metaphor for some of our disciplines in our life in the Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10, that's not our lesson for today, but let me just kind of give you an on-ramp to our lesson. Here's what he says. He says, And now a final word. <clears throat> Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. And again, that term heavenly places is his reference to that unseen spiritual world. And so then he, what he does is he walks through uh, a, a metaphor that you may be familiar with called the armor of God the shoes of the gospel of peace, the breastplate of righteousness, uh, the shield of faith, all of these pieces of our armor that refer to various aspects of our Christ fellowship. And our passage today is going to pick up at the very tail end of that discussion about the armor of God, beginning in verse 17. So Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 17, this is what it sounds like. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. Let's unpack this. The helmet of salvation. Uh, I think of the helmet of salvation as there to protect our minds, if you will. It goes around our head. It's there to protect our minds. This is the work that the Spirit of God in us is doing and does when we are saved, when we enter into a saving relationship to begin to follow Jesus, when our faith journey begins in that regard, the Spirit of God enters into us. And one of the things the Spirit begins to do is He begins to protect our minds if we will get out of His way and let Him do that. He begins to protect our intellectual, uh, our intellectual um, processes and begins to protect our mind. But he also talks about taking up the sword of the Spirit, which Paul goes on to describe it, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit. If prayer then is what we think of as communicating with God, then the Word of God is necessarily an integral part of that prayer, would it not be? 
I mean, if, if, if our prayer time is communing with God and, and, and communicating with God, not, it, it has to be a two-way street. So it's not only me talking to God, but it's also should have a heavy component, maybe a much heavier component of God talking to me. And he does that through the word of God, through the sword of the spirit. Uh, what kind of a relationship would it be if, if communication only went one direction? What kind of a friendship would you have with someone if you did all the talking and they never did any talking, or vice versa, if they're the ones, only ones that ever talked and you never responded? That's not a friendship. That's not a relationship at all. And so relationship necessarily implies two-way communication. What kind of warfare would we be able to fight if we only had communication going in one direction, we can talk to God, but we but He can't speak to us. We can't hear anything from Him. What kind of soldier would we be if we were outside of communication, uh, of any kind of communication? It's actually it's actually a common strategy in actual warfare. I I am told I've I've been led to believe in my reading, it is an actual common strategy of warfare to do what you can to destroy the lines of communication between soldiers and headquarters. And so you'll see uh, in, in actual combat, in actual warfare, you'll see people bombing places that it makes no sense to bomb, but what you realize they're doing is they're actually bombing underground lines of communication in order to cut off soldiers from their headquarters so that they can't receive orders anymore. And so uh, communication becomes critical, right, to spiritual warfare. Uh, 1, Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 also talks about this idea of being in constant communication. Again, the Apostle Paul says, Always be joyful and never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Never stop praying. Some English translations say, pray without ceasing. So always being in communication, always kind of having the God earbud in where I'm able to communicate with God no matter where I am, no matter what I'm doing, no matter what's going on, always in communication with God. Paul's, Paul's observation here is that spiritual warfare requires constant lines of communication. This is our first implication about prayer as a means of spiritual warfare. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in that first statement. The spiritual warfare to which Christ followers are called can only be fought on our knees. If we are to stand against the spiritual forces of darkness all around us, prayer becomes a central and critical discipline to that process. But he goes on, Paul goes on then to give us an actual direction for that prayer. Look what he says next. To that end, he says, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And so the direction of our prayer, the, the topic of our prayer, in much of it is other people, praying for other people, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance. So we're staying watchful. We're staying mindful of the spiritual warfare that's going on around us. We're always mindful of it. And this watchfulness or this mindfulness is tied to our prayer and our supplication. It is our prayer, it is our being in communication with God that helps us stay alert and mindful uh, of what's going on around us. There is this sense in which our time spent in communion with God is how we stay alert. That's how we do it. We don't just stay alert by opening our eyes and looking around. It's an unseen spiritual world. You're not going to see that spiritual warfare going on around you. And so it is our prayer that actually helps us to be more alert uh, with all perseverance to the spiritual realities around us. And then he says, making supplications for all the saints. Much like Jesus demonstrated in uh, his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17. You know, we have very few full prayers 
where we got to hear and, and read what it is Jesus prayed. He spent so many hours all the time in communication with the Father and in prayer with the Father. But we have very few actual instances where we get long versions of what he was actually praying. But in John chapter 17, we get that. We're gonna actually study that in a, later in this unit. So I don't wanna jump into it too heavily. But one of the things he does in John chapter 17 is he prays for the disciples. He prays over them and for them. And then he turns his heart toward the future and prays over us and prays for all people who will believe. Um, and, and so there's a, he, he models this idea of intercession for us. Part of our spiritual warfare is to be praying for and over one another. Now, even Jesus' brother, Pastor James, who gave us the book of James in Scripture, even he talks about this in his book in James chapter 5. He says, Are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. And if you've committed any sins, you will be forgiven. And so he has that same idea of praying over one another. Uh, it, it's more than just mere being merely being in God's presence. The kind of prayer for spiritual warfare is more than just resting in His presence. It's talking with God about others, holding them before the Lord and talking with Him and praying His blessings over them, asking Him to bless them and to encourage them, to heal them and to grow them and to protect them. That's what intercessory prayer is all about. It's being with God but talking about others especially including those, and this is key, especially including those with whom we strongly disagree. Jesus talked about this in, in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. He says, You have heard that the law says, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true, true children of your Father in heaven. So we call this intercession, that's the fancy church word for it, when we're praying for other people. But Jesus would go out of his way to make sure he says to us, make sure you are praying for those who persecute you, for those who you consider your enemies, for those who hurt you. Pray for them. Uh, that's, in, that's included in that intercession. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the second statement. The spiritual warfare to which Christ followers are called is to stand and commune with God on behalf of others, especially for those we would consider our enemies. So then Paul turns and asks the church in Ephesus to pray not only for one another, but he asks them specifically to pray for himself. Look what he says in verse 19. And also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So the teacher, the teacher of prayer is asking for prayers for himself. He's asking for prayers that are aimed at helping him, and this is key, helping him to fulfill the calling God has placed on his life. Paul had a crystal clear sense of that calling. He knew exactly what he was on this earth to do. He, he talks about it often in many of his letters. One of my favorite places he talks about it is in Colossians chapter 1, verse 25. He says, God has given me the responsibility of serving his church by proclaiming his message to you in its wholeness, in its completeness. And so, he knows what he's here to do, and when he asks people to pray for him, that's what he's asking them to do is pray that I will complete, that I will fulfill my mission. Pray that I will do what God has given me to do and that I will do it well. Proclaiming the word of God, that's what he asks for prayer for. And by asking for this prayer, he knows that what he's doing is he's asking them to pray in alignment with what God has already said he wants Paul to do. He's asking them to pray in alignment with God's will, in accordance with God's will. The same way Jesus would say it in, in, in John chapter 14, Jesus says, you can ask for anything 
in my name. That's an important qualifier. And I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. What does that mean, in my name? What it means is praying in accordance with the nature and purposes of Jesus. And so when we pray in alignment, with God's will, when we pray in alignment with the nature and purposes of Jesus, when that's the way we are praying, we can rest assured God's going to hear that prayer because it's all we're asking him to do is what he's already said he's going to do. That's what Paul was asking them to do as well. Praying in accordance with the nature and purpose of Jesus, this is what he's asking them to pray for. If you have your listening guide, fill in the third statement on your listening guide with me. There is no stronger way to do spiritual warfare on behalf of others than to pray for them to experience God's perfect will in their lives. And that's worthy of asking God to do for them. But there's more to his request here for prayer. Think about, think about not only what he asked them to pray for, but think about what he does not ask them to pray for. I think that's worth looking at. Look what he says here in verse 20. The gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. What does he mean when he says, I am an ambassador in chains? Well, what he means is, at the time he wrote this letter, this is one of the letters that he wrote from prison, in chains, literally in chains. He was, we don't know for sure which imprisonment he wrote this from. Uh, It may have been his house arrest in Rome when he was awaiting Uh, his appeal to Caesar. It may have been an earlier imprisonment uh, where he was literally in chains, but what what, what we know is he wrote this letter from prison. And, And I think it's interesting, having written this letter from prison, he doesn't ask them to pray about those physical circumstances at all. He doesn't talk, he doesn't talk to them about that. He doesn't ask them, hey, pray that that, that I'll get meals every day or pray that pray about these this hardship that I'm going through physically or pray that I'll get free from prison. He doesn't ask for any of that. Uh, miserable though his circumstances no doubt were, that's not what he asked them to pray for. He asked them to pray rather for that he would open his mouth boldly even from prison that he would continue to fulfill the mission that God's given him to fulfill. He has this, such this clear sense that he is exactly where he is supposed to be and that he has a ministry assignment right there in prison. He has this clear sense of that. So thinking about prayer as communication with God, uh, as a connected to spiritual warfare, this will change the things that we ask God to do. This will change the things we ask him for. Our focus, when we think about it as spiritual warfare, our focus begins to shift, right? It begins to shift more and more away from just mere physical circumstances and more and more towards spiritual callings and spiritual assignments. Soldiers do not go to war thinking to themselves, I just hope that this will be pain-free and I hope that that I'll be comfortable, nice and cushy and comfortable the whole time I'm fighting this war. That's not what their, where their focus is at all. And, and, and so there's an element to this spiritual warfare metaphor that Paul is helping us understand that these prayers, at first, when you're talking about spiritual warfare, these are not prayers for comfort. These are not prayers for, for safety even, quite frankly, if not physical safety anyway. These are prayers for spiritual realities. That's where the focus shifts to. This is an example, and by the way, There are going to be many of these kinds of examples in this particular Bible study series. This is an example of prayer changing the one who's praying. That's one of the purposes of prayer. It's not for, it's not an opportunity for me to change God, for me to influence God, for me to manipulate God or control God to make him do the things I want him to do. That's not, that's not what prayer is about. Prayer, being in the presence of God is an opportunity for God to change me the one praying, to cause me to begin asking for different things, to be praying for different things, to reprioritize my life so that other things, spiritual realities, become much more important to me than physical circumstances. Changing how we see ourselves, changing how we see the world around us in that regard. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the last statement on your listening guide. Praying about physical circumstances is perfectly acceptable 
even needed, but it is a sign of spiritual growth when our prayers focus more on spiritual realities than on physical circumstances. Such an important takeaway in this lesson. So what have we said about prayer and spiritual warfare? Just summarizing four points. Number one, prayer is a central and critical discipline for spiritual warfare. Number two, spiritual warfare includes praying for others, especially our enemies. Number three, praying for others means praying for them to experience God's perfect will in their lives. And number four, spiritually mature prayer for others focuses more and more on spiritual realities than on physical circumstances. These are some of my takeaways anyway from this passage. I wonder what yours are. This is going to be an exciting series. I'm so excited about doing this series with you. Looking forward to this. We're going to pick up right here next week again with another passage that teaches us about prayer. I look forward to that. In the meantime, I love you guys. Hope you have a great week. We'll see you here next time.